Our next move matters. It will set the tone for what tomorrow, next month, next year looks like. Let's step with purpose into this undeniably different world. Let's lean into the challenges and find out what's possible on the other side. We'll cheer each other on and thank those who during the shutdown never slowed down. We'll listen, learn, and believe in the promise that progress holds. There will be small wins, mistakes, hard decisions, and moments of real hope. No matter what lies ahead, we'll face it with courage because there's only one direction worth moving. So that we can share it uh, after it's over. Additionally, we want to make this still as interactive as possible. And so with that being said, we would like for you all to feel free to use your reaction buttons. And then if you do have questions, go ahead and chat them and we'll make sure to get to them. That being said, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in to our featured speaker. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Fred McKinney. He is with BJM Solutions and he resides in Connecticut. Dr. Fred is a distinguished professor, author, and entrepreneur who was named the Carl Highsmith Chair for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and is the director of the People's United Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Quinnipiac University. Dr. Fred will be the lead faculty member of the Wichita Entrepreneur, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Series, which you'll hear more about today, and is brought to us by Burns and McDonald, Aparisi Constructors, Evergy, and is a part of the Wichita Waterworks program. Here with the encouraging word to kick us off today is Dr. Fred McKinney. Thank you. Good morning to all and thank you, Christina, for your warm introduction. And I just want to do a sound check. Am I being heard, Christina? Yes, you sure are. Okay, well, fantastic. Well, thank you. And I can't think of a, a better way to, send, to spend a Saturday morning than with a bunch of entrepreneurs. And so I'm very excited uh, about the program that we're going to start today. And today I've just got a couple of things that I want to accomplish. One is to introduce myself to the uh, business community in, in Wichita. I did visit uh, last year pre-COVID. And as many of you know, this was planned. I was I was supposed to be in Wichita today. So I'm, I'm not in Wichita because of COVID. I'm here in my home in Connecticut. And, but we still are not gonna let that stop us from having a, what I hope to be a very impactful program for all of the participants. And let me just th start off by saying, I also wanna thank the sponsors that Christina mentioned. Uh, they have been very supportive of this activity. And as she said, they allowed us to pivot from an on-ground program to an, an, a virtual program. Um, as, as many of you know, you're, the, the virtual approach is, is becoming sort of the norm. So I'm sure all of us are now sort of Zoom experts. And so I wanna continue that, that Zoom expertise in this, in this uh, class that we're gonna start today and, and, and run through November. So one thing I want to do is to kind of give you an, over, an overview of what you have to look forward to uh, this, this, this summer, this fall, and, and into the winter. Uh, the Wichita Entrepreneurship and Innovation Series is a program that, uh, with the help of Christina and her team and, and our sponsors, uh, we have designed to assist entrepreneurs in the greater Wichita area to take full advantage of the opportunities, not just with the Wichita Waterworks project, but moving forward uh, with all of the opportunities that exist uh, in Wichita and around the country and literally around the globe. So with that, we can go to the next slides. And I'd like to start with a couple of, of, uh, of quotes. The roots of education are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. And so the, the message here to the participants is uh, we're going to stress you a little bit. I think education should be a little stressful because that's how we grow. But the, 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 the benefit of what we want to do this semester, this year, is I think going to pay dividends. And I think at the end, by November, you will be 
something that was well worth the time and the energy. So, um, you know, I want you to, this is work. This is going to be work for you. It's going to be work for, for me and the, the team of faculty that we put together. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we think okay. that there will be a significant benefit to you as an entrepreneur and your business. Next slide. Uh, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Uh, Malcolm X. Uh, you, many might be surprised to see that this quote associated with Malcolm, but he understood that education, business education, entrepreneurial education is highly important for our success. And so, you know, the future uh, is coming and today is now and we're going to prepare for it this, uh, this, in this class. And again, I, I really believe that uh, this is going to work, not just for us, it's going to work for you and the community in Wichita. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about uh, what we are going to do um, this pro, and I, I like to call it a semester, okay, <laughs> for lack of a better term. So I'll tell you what we're going to do this semester. We're going to cover strategy, um, and I'm going to do the strategy session, uh, and that's going to start this coming week. Um, and in strategy, what we're going to look at is not just you're here, you want to go there, how do you get there, and what are the obstacles that you have to overcome to get there efficiently and profitably. So we're going to cover strategic thinking. We're going to cover how that matters for your company. Uh, you know, a lot of, lot of people think, well, strategy, that's, that's for the big companies. No, strategy is for entrepreneurs no matter where they are. We're going to decide how to get there, and we're going to go through some, some tools to, to help you understand uh, your strategic initiatives. And, and let me stop there for one second and tell you that this is work. I want all of the people who are going to participate in this program to be prepared to come to the class all of the classes are prepared to do some work. So what do I mean by that? You're gonna be watching on Zoom, but I want you also to take notes. Uh, you might even wanna get your own notebook that for this semester so you can keep track of all of the things that you learned and, and maybe we spark some ideas, put it in that notebook. I carry around the bound book just for, the, for that purpose. I, I highly recommend that you try to document this series uh, with that. Uh, after strategy, we're going to have a couple of our, our faculty members are going to talk about finance. Uh, finance, as you know, is all important. Uh, you need to have the money to do what you need to do. Uh, and we've got some excellent professors that are going to talk about finance. One is an author who wrote the book called Loot Scout. And in that book, he says, okay, how do, where is the money? How do you go and get it? If you don't have teams of lawyers and finance people, where is the money? and how do you get it? The other faculty member for that's gonna cover finance is a, a guy that's been a long time colleague of mine who just retired from the Harvard Business School, Steve Rogers. And Steve is gonna talk about finance in difficult times. And we clearly are in difficult times. And so Steve is, is a late addition to the program, but I'm so glad that he was available and, and has agreed to participate in the program. Uh, after finance, we're gonna have a session on marketing. And we're going to, you guys are going to be thrilled to meet a good friend of mine and a marketing uh, guru uh, by the name of Ramon Peralta. And Ramon runs a business, Peralta Design, uh, here in Connecticut. And uh, he is an expert in traditional marketing, but he's also an expert in sort of the new forms of marketing, social media, and all of those things that uh, can actually leverage what you do in traditional marketing in a digital space. So that's one of the things that uh, Ramon is going to bring to the table. Uh, the fourth topic is, in, is economics. So my, my business partner, uh, Dr. Gerald James, who is a professor at Yale in the economics department, is going to talk about the role economics plays in your business. And, uh, and while economics often takes a 30,000 foot level view of, of business, that view can be very helpful in helping you understand what your next moves should be. And, and finally, we're gonna end with innovation. And so innovation kind of takes us full circle from strategy through finance, through marketing, through economics, to innovation, because it's through innovation that's gonna separate you from 
the competition and create those opportunities that didn't exist before you came up with them. So you guys are gonna come up with some good stuff this semester. So uh, just words of introduction, Christine has already introduced me. I'm a partner, founder of BJM, I'm a professor at Quinnipiac University. I ran the uh, Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council, part of the National Minority Supplier Development Council with the, that we covered the six New England states. I, I was president of that organization for 15 years from 2001 to 2015. And after that, I worked at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, where I ran the executive education for diverse business owners. So this experience has helped me form this, uh, our, my views on how do you build successful diverse businesses. Anthony Price is the, is the finance person that I mentioned. He is a consultant, the author of Loot Scout. And I'm, I'm, you guys are going to get a big kick out of his approach to teaching finance and business. He's a, you're going to really enjoy Anthony's presentation. Next, Ramon Peralta I mentioned. I, I saw he's, he's on the call, actually. And so we might be able to introduce him later. But Ramon is the founder of Peralta Designs, honorary doctorate at the University of Bridgeport uh, for a lot of his work in building community here in Connecticut. He's also a, an experienced trustee and a director of several companies. Steve Rogers is a retired professor from Harvard Business School who is going to teach finance in difficult times. He is, uh, he's out of Chicago. Uh, as Ebony Magazine named him one of the 150 most influential uh, people in America. Uh, he is also an author. Gerald James, my partner, uh, he is the professor at Yale and is going to cover economics. Uh, he is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So we've got some heavyweights uh, coming to Wichita. Here's the schedule. So we start on August 3rd, which is Monday. And these are all your, uh, these are, these are Eastern times, is that right? We got that right, Christina? So, so it'll be 6 to 8 p.m. Central Time, and we have that slide as well that talks about how to register. Thank you. Okay, cool. So uh, this is the schedule. August 3rd, we're meeting. We have two meetings in uh, September uh, with Anthony Price and Steve Rogers and myself again. In October, we meet with Ramon Peralta, and then in November, It'll be Gerald James and myself to talk about economics and innovation. But one of the novel things that really is sort of the benefit of doing it this way, uh, as opposed to on ground, is because of the virtual uh, possibilities, we're going to have one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions for any entrepreneur that participates in the program. This is an opportunity for you as the entrepreneur to ask me and the faculty members specific questions that you're facing that could be really helpful to you and your business. And so we've scheduled those. And again, I just wanna thank our sponsors, Burns and McDonald, Wichita Waterworks, Evergy, and Alberici. So uh, I'm, I'm, I think I finished, I've got uh, three minutes left in my talk. And so if I have some questions, some time in Q&A. If uh, Christina, to, if someone could take a look at there any questions, I could address those questions at this point. Thank you. We have not had any questions come through, but I would like to ask you, Dr. Fred, with all of your experience and as we prepare to get into the work of today's program, can you talk about and give some encouragement to entrepreneurs who have joined us today? Oh, certainly. So, you know, I heard in the, in the introductory slide uh, program, uh, you had some excellent comments from some local entrepreneurs. And one of the things that, um, that, that, that resonated with me uh, was the comment that uh, entrepreneurship requires a leap of faith, that there is, it's necessary for you to believe that you can get somewhere with your business. And, um, you know, if you look and talk to successful entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of people told them no along the way before they became successful. And you know what? They didn't listen to them. And so they had a dream, they had a vision, and they thought about how to execute that vision, how to, be, how to make that dream a reality. And I think that is, is where you might be right now. So it, it is, you know, it's tough. It's tougher than normal, given the economic and healthcare circumstances that we find ourselves in today. 
but there are a number of very successful businesses that got started during difficult times like this. And so while it's tough, I think that one way you may want to look at it is how can I as an entrepreneur take advantage of all of the circumstances that uh, we face right now. And believe me, there are opportunities. And entrepreneurs, quite frankly, are gonna be the reason that we get out of this situation. So the, the Wichita is counting on you to solve these problems. And I think that you got it, you can do it. I mean, I've been out there, I've seen it, I've talked to several of you, and I, I just believe very firmly that this is an opportunity for Wichita to uh, to grow and the minority uh, business community in Wichita to take uh, to take off. And so that's what we're going to try to do to try to assist in that. But this is about you. We're going to make this work for you and your families and your community. So I'm, I'm excited about this and I hope that you are too. And I want you to go and tell more people, uh, you know, with the virtual world, it doesn't matter if we have 50 people or 200 people. Uh, so let's let's get the word out because we want to change the community. We want to change the dynamics. And again, it's going to be up to you. And I know you're up for it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fred, for that wonderful word and for giving us a really good opportunity to see what is coming ahead to Wichita entrepreneurs. We wanted to take our opening time to be able to talk about this series because my, my PowerPoint keeps wanting to advance and give away the good stuff. So we'll just keep it here for a second. Uh, we wanted to be able to open up our series today and talking about um, what is coming to Wichita because in the context and the backdrop of the country right now, there are a lot of things that are happening. And one of the things that I have been so pleased to be able to see is the access and the information and the importance about making sure that we are breaking barriers and making sure that we are adjusting and addressing disparities that have, quite honestly, set our people back. It is delayed progress. And so right now is a time to begin to correct the wrongs, correct the ills. And education is one of the ways that we can do that. So we want to be able to thank Dr. Fred and the faculty that will be coming to Wichita to be able to assist and to help us be able to grow um, with the expertise that they do have. It is a privilege to be able to have this level of expertise in our area and we thank them. Now I do want to say as we begin to transition into our workshop breakouts that expertise comes in a variety of packages. It comes through your education, it also comes through your experience. And so today, you all live an experience that is expertise. You all are living the experience of launching and growing your companies, and that is special. And so when we talk about coming together through the Create Campaign, we want you to feel fully involved, fully engaged. Share your expertise today. Going into our workshop sessions, we have a number of um, options for people to learn from. Many of you did select a workshop when you pre-registered, and it is my privilege to be able to introduce the speakers for these workshops briefly today. Brady Sherman's gonna be in room one. He is with the Center for Entrepreneurship at Wichita State University, and he wanna present that I've got an idea, but is it a business? Brady is a Kansas native who spent time working for a Coke as a business analyst on the strategy and innovation team and procurement group. He also co-founded a local startup called Micromanches, among other efforts. We're really, Pleased to have you today, Brady. Thank you for joining us. In room two, we've got Zach Wiggins, and this is a popular breakout. He's an attorney with Martin Pringle, and he's going to be discussing how to structure a business. Mark, uh, Zach joined Martin Pringle as an associate attorney in 2011 and was elected in a partnership in 2016. He's been with the Create Campaign since we began, and so we welcome you back. A quick reminder, everyone, please go ahead and mute your, your microphones. We're picking up some background noise again, and we want to make sure that everybody can hear. Thank you so much. Moving forward in room three is um, our friend from Kansas City. He's Daryl Johnson. He's the president and CEO of Business Credit Works. It helps entrepreneurs obtain capital and credit to fuel their dreams. 
Um, he is a longtime business and financial professional serving for companies including Charles Schwab, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and many more. Again, he'll be covering how to build business credit. And rounding us off is Tiawana Hartwell, who is in room four. She will be discussing marketing tools and tips and tricks to get the job done. She is the founder of Mamarazzi Entertainment Magazine, and she is also the owner of Mamarazzi Communications, a newly named LLC. Congratulations on that, Tijuana. She was honored most recently as well as um, an honoree with the Wichita Business Journal's Women Who Lead in Marketing and Communications. Before we hop into the workshop sessions, we do have a prize giveaway. This prize giveaway is our, let's see here, is our relaxation basket. So as entrepreneurs, we know that um, there's a lot of times that we just can be stressed out, our schedules are crazy and things of that nature. And so we have a, excuse me, a relaxation basket that features candles from Cloud9. All of these are black owned businesses, by the way. Candles from Cloud9. We have products from Shea by Dolce. We also have some of the products from our featured panelists who are gonna come up later on in our program from Soul Popped Gourmet Popcorn, and Joe's Gourmet. We have a $100 gift card to Emerge Skin and Body Spa. And we have the book for the greater success by CML Collective and pulling um, I'm going to be pulling names here. So, let's see here. Congratulations, J. Trez Buckles. So if J. Trez is on, you won. All right, we'll begin now to move into our workshop sessions and we'll come back together after the workshops. all of these wonderful uh, inspirations that are gonna come up. We have joining us today, DJ Lozada, who is the owner and founder of Soul Pop Gourmet Popcorn. She started Soul Popped in 2016 with just $53 in her bank account and has gone on to do a half million in sales. In late 2019, she was able to grow into her first retail location in Austin's premier indoor mall, Barton Creek Square, making her the first African-American business owner to have a storefront in that location. She's earned numerous, numerous recognitions including being named a Tory Burch Foundation Fellow, among others. She's joining us today from Austin. DJ, thank you so much for joining us. Next, we have Miranda walker Dow. Miranda is an innovative thought leader and transformational executive. She's the co-founder of Joe's Gourmet, um, and she's been able to grow that company along with Joe Dow from a kitchen recipe to more than two million in sales. Uh, they are selling their product in Walmart, Kroger, Public, Safeway, and HEB. Through her innovative approach to marketing, she has curated appearances for Joe Gourmet on QVC, Good Morning America, and ABC's Shark Tank. I've known her for a really long time. She has incredibly deep roots in Wichita, Miranda. Hey, Next everybody. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Next up, we have Steve Polter. Steve is the Senior Vice President of Coke Agronomic Services. He leads both the agricultural and turf and ornamental businesses. Um, providing KAS customers with industry-leading nutrient use sufficiency products and investments within the biological space. In his role, he's responsible for positioning the company through future growth opportunities with the development of new products, partnerships, and acquis acquisitions. Steve, welcome. And then last but not least, we have Terry Reed. Terrence Terry Reed is a Vice President of Human Resources for Coke Engineered Solutions. He has global responsibility for all aspects of human resources management, and um, he's working with employees in 27 different countries. He leads a team of about 70 resources there as well. Uh, he and his team are partnering with business leaders across the company to be able to make the company its place and, I'm sorry, to make the company a place where all employees wish to work. Terry, thank you so much for joining us. We are going to jump right into our questions and let me pull these down. <clears throat> we're going to jump right into our questions and we're going to go to you first, DJ. Building a soul food inspired popcorn company isn't an everyday business venture. Please describe your purpose for launching your company and a key lesson you learned early on about taking a concept from idea to the marketplace. Hi, good morning again, everybody, and thank you for having me today. Uh, I started Soul Popped uh, more out of necessity than out of a desire to just be creative. 
Um, I went through an eight year, you know, I was an executive, um, actually the diversity officer for all higher education for the state of Texas. And I got sick and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. So I couldn't get disability and I couldn't get FMLA. Uh, two kids in college, single mom and mounting medical bills. And it left me with $53 to my name. I burned through my 401k, I burned through, I mean, it was just a horrible time. And so um, when I was laying in my bed with, on a tear-soaked pillow, praying to God for, for solutions, um, it came to me that I had to use what I had to get what I needed. And what I had was food. Um, and my favorite snack had always been popcorn. And I know from being a serial entrepreneur that if you are going to get into something, if you're not innovating, you're wasting your time and everybody else's time. And so I said, okay, what's authentic to me that I can share with the world through my popcorn? And that was soul food. And I just know from being a mom and a shopper and caring about healthy ingredients and healthy foods. I lived abroad for 10 years. And so that really, and I grew up on a, in the country. I'm from the sticks in North Carolina. So we don't eat processed food. We grow it, we raise it. And so uh, when it was time for me to start Soul Pop, I knew I wanted to have that commitment to healthy, um, all natural ingredients. And I wanted to elevate soul food to a place where I'd seen other cuisines elevated and I understood that soul food is really the basis of American food and so um, I did what was authentic to me and my first flavor was fried chicken popcorn it's which is vegan and um, just using the spices in my kitchen and from there I created um, about 16 other flavors and um, the rest is history so that's really where that inspiration came from. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That, that's major. And your popcorn is amazing. Uh, my aunt introduced me on a family reunion to Soul Popped, and so I'm completely fanning out. Another person who I'm fanning out about is Miranda. You know, in a market full uh -huh. of seasonings, discuss how your family through, through Joe's Gourmet was able to break through and share one practice that you used early on to distinguish your product from others. Hey everybody, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I would say, you know, she's right. Innovation is everything. Um, seasoning can be a very crowded marketplace. Um, ours was a little bit different. Our business was driven completely by the customer um, and somewhat out of necessity as well. Um, my husband um, owns a restaurant in New Orleans during Katrina and um, was completely wiped out. And he was like, hey, I got a recipe. I have some fryers, let's get it. So he started traveling all over um, the East Coast, you know, um, HBCU homecomings, people's favorite concerts, your favorite festival. He had a tent, his fryers and his recipe. Um, and the customer then began to drive us uh, to put it in store. So it started off, people would say, hey, you're at my favorite festival every year. I buy a, pay, a plate of fish, but I'm not going to see you till next year. So can you put some of your seasoning in a bag for me so that I can duplicate it at home and I can pretend to be Joe at home, you know? Um, and so he was doing that and he kind of saw it as very irritating, honestly. He was trying to sell fish plates and you know, make money over the weekend and um, selling this product wasn't something that he had really considered. Um, but so, you know, what we did is we were just trying to make him more profitable when he went out on the road. We went and got uh, packaging. We started putting together the colors, the scheme of the product. Um, and, you know, the customer said, hey, I'm getting this product in at FAMU's homecoming. I want to get it um, online because Christmas is coming up and I want to order it at Christmas time. So we started selling it online. Um, what happened is I purchased about 15,000 packages um, 
from China because it's a lot cheaper to buy a lot of packaging than it is a small amount. DJ could probably attest to that. And, you know, I just kind of thought, eh, we'll have it, you know, let's see what happens. We, you know, piled the packaging up in our basement. And a year later, those 15,000 bags were gone. Um, and so at that time, I was uh, working, I was a real estate executive for a company called CB Richard Ellis. So I sold a lot of shopping centers and things like that. It was, I was not a food girl. That was not my thing. But um, when I went downstairs and saw, oh my God, you sold 15,000 bags in 12 months. We got to do something with this. And thankfully, um, I began with the end in mind and already had a retail ready pack, which I would strongly suggest that people are putting together packages, um, make it as retail ready as possible. Begin with the end in mind so that you can scale quickly. Um, and we went in and pitched our first grocery store here in Georgia and the rest is history. <laughs> so. awesome. And you're going to share a little bit more about that history. Um, mm -hmm. when we talk about how your company began to gain national exposure by being on Shark Tank and also Good Morning America with that exposure as well, how did that impact your brand? So talk about how you got that exposure and how mm -hmm. it impacted your brand, please. Um, we, everything in our company was driven by the customer. We saw that customer's reaction when they took their first bite of shrimp. Um, when we were in the grocery stores, we physically went to the grocery store and demoed all day. So we would get feedback from the customer. Um, and one thing we realized, and, and we joked about this with the sharks on Shark Tank about, oh, if they try it, they're going to buy it. It was a joke, but it wasn't a joke. Um, for every sample that we gave, we usually, if we gave out 10 samples, seven people would spend money with us. So, um, my thought process was, you know, we're demoing these stores individually, one at a time. I would really love to do a big demo. Um, and that was the idea of going on Shark Tank is that we could demo the product and people that other people trust. Um, would be able to see how the product makes you feel. You know what I'm saying? Because it's, it's a feeling. It's about, we're, we're not selling fish fry. We're selling a feeling. We're, we're selling family. We're selling togetherness. We're selling an event. People gather around fish fries to celebrate things. People gather around fish fries for recreational use. It's, you know, they're going fishing. They're going hunting. They're out camping. It's about togetherness. And so we wanted to mimic what we were seeing in the street for America. So um, what I did is I just went on the website. I don't even know. I went on the website, found out when they were doing an audition, showed up, harassed them to no end, and um, made the cut. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. You yeah. know, it also takes something to be able to have your, your product, but then commit it to a storefront. So DJ, talk about what your expansion into your storefront was like real quickly. If you guys see me smiling so big. It's just, I love seeing other people of color and food. So congratulations <laughs> to you, Miranda, and to you your family. You too, DJ. Just, I, my cheeks hurt. I'm just smiling so big for your success. Um, so for me, I'm the exact opposite. I didn't want to go to grocery stores. <laughs> I just, just the whole, and you, you know, Miranda, you can tell them it's, it's a whole thing yes. when you yes. go into grocery stores with the chargebacks and the, the demos and the marketing budgets and, and mm -hmm. you got to be brokers and you got to do this. And so for me, um, Soul Pop is, you know, really, I like to say that we're created in a kitchen by a mom who loves to cook and not in a lab by a chemist. And so part of that soul food experience is really like not being overly processed and, and, and having your hands in the food. So you have your love in that food. That's what soul food is all about. And so when the grocery stores were coming at me and they were coming at me from the start, I was just like, no, this is not what I want to do right, right now. Not ever, just right now. Um, and so, you know, I started out at the farmer's markets and that's where I got my product uh, validation was through the farmer's markets. And Soul Pop just took off word of mouth. 
Uh, I turned down Shark Tank three times. <laughs> no, that sounds crazy. And I never applied. They came after me. They were like, hey, we want you on the show. And I was like, I've seen, mm -mm, no, not interested. And so part of what I've always done is really be, um, take a different approach to how you grow in food. I didn't take on investors. My company is 100% unfunded. Um, so from $53 to where, I, where I've gone today, it's just based off of word of mouth and direct sales to customers. Now, I'm at a point now where I just took on my first co-manufacturer. And I went into the store because I wanted to have, like Miranda, I wanted to still have that, that, um, that touch point directly with my consumer. Because that's where you really learn a lot about yourself and about your product. It's everything. It's everything, right? And it's hard to do that when it's sitting static on a shelf, for, especially for a brand like Soul Food Popcorn. I didn't just make popcorn. I created a whole new genre of food. And so what does banana pudding popcorn taste like? What does chicken and waffles popcorn taste like? Well, it's hard to imagine that when it's in a bag sitting on a shelf. But when I have that direct face-to-face -face with you or one of my employees does, that instant feedback and that instant gratification is there when you realize, oh my God, this tastes just like I'm eating banana pudding. Absolutely. Chicken and waffles or, or fried chicken or whatever it is. So the storefront made sense to me because we want it to be an experience brand. And then not only in my store could you come in and try it, you could literally create your own popcorn flavors. So we're the first in the country to have a popcorn store where you have on-demand customization of popcorn. And so COVID changed all of that. Yeah. Uh, and I can say this now because I didn't, I, I'm working a deal with a shark now, so I can't be on the show. But I actually was supposed to be on season 12, which is this year of Shark Tank. Um, I can't do it anymore. So COVID has really been a pivot, but that's why I wanted to start the storefront is because I still wanted to have that. I had to have a way to grow my customer base, but also not be retail grocery. We're growing to a point now where we're ready to have a little mixture of that, where we're pivoting, but uh, away from the storefronts because COVID is not going to, I don't see this going away anytime soon. So we're yeah. having to change our model a little bit. Absolutely. Thanks for taking us through that. So we've heard a little bit from Miranda and DJ about building. I'm going to switch to to Steve and Terry from Coke. Uh, when we're talking about manifesting what we've built. Steve, planning is essential for entrepreneurs to be able to build and grow businesses. So with your experience at Coke, which is a global company, what are some key metrics you'd recommend a business owner can track to determine if their companies are ready to grow? Well, thanks a lot, Christine. And I think one thing we heard from Miranda and, and DJ is that there's no one size fits all. So the caveat I'm going to say with my comments is, Every business is different and, and how you want to do it and the time you do things is obviously gonna, going to vary. So, but I, I would say one thing that I would start with is a place I've seen uh, maybe most of the ill-advised growth over, over my career and maybe in the market is just people trying to do it um, too fast or too big or too glamorous, maybe before the time was right. And I think what, what you've heard from you know all the people today is that there, there is that point, and as entrepreneurs, you're all taking risks and gambles, um, but we need to make sure we're taking smart risks. So in, in the businesses I look at and, and oversee, one of the things we definitely want to see, and the first thing I always look at is our NIA, are we making money? And I think at the end of the day, you need to be making some money to grow. Um, next thing that I look at is you, you have to be as close to maximizing your assets as you can be before growing. I mean, there's a lot of instances where a, a plant or a an asset doesn't make money until it's 70% full. And the last thing you wanna do is start growing when you're only at 65% of that one. So I would encourage everyone to not think that the next step has to be building or buying the next plant. Um, there may be ways to rent someone else's asset or space or co-pack. Like DJ just mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities out there to be creative and to conserve your cash. Um, one of the things we do, at Coke is really understand or establish what we call our optimized base case. So what I mean by that is optimizing the current state to get the greatest value out of that before you before you expand or, or make different investments. So the question I would ask is, is, has I really wrung everything out of the asset that I can? So in that, I look at metrics like asset utilization rates, and this could be 
basis plants or people hours or that sort of thing. And another key thing that we look at is revenue or gross margin per unit or per salesperson or per mechanic, per hairdresser, per restaurant table, whatever your business is, that, those sort of metrics. Nice. Um, the other thing that you need to have is a point of view on the market. And so really how much demand and capacity is there? And for us, we use supply stacks to measure these, to, to give us kind of a graphic representation of the competitors and their estimated costs. But you really need to answer the question, what is the overall growth rate of the market? And on sold popcorn, it may be, you know, a completely different thing than if you're a, you know, a landscaper in Wichita, Kansas. But I think you need to take and understand what that is and what you think your growth can be. And then make sure you're realistic on that and that you can capture it and the time it'll take to get there because those sorts of things will determine when and how much you invest in your growth and, and maybe how to be creative and again, maybe use other people's assets or whatever in the short term until you can bridge it enough to where you have the, the cash flow to pay for that yourself. Okay. And then the, the, the last thing we do is really look at the marginal analysis of any of those things that you're, that you're going to invest in. So, and by marginal analysis, I mean examining the additional benefit compared to the additional cost uh, from your current state. So sometimes on these, it's easier for an example, but let's just say you have a business that um, you have costs of $80 and revenue of a hundred. So you're making $200 and you say, I want to grow. And you think that renting a nicer space might bring in an additional $40 in revenue. So your revenue went from a hundred to 140, which by a lot of definitions would say you've grown. But when you do the math, the lease and the extra costs will go up $50. So you go from 80 to 130. So in theory, you've grown, but you've lost $10 of gross margin in the process. Mm -hmm. I would just highly encourage everyone to, to not grow for growth's sake, mm -hmm. but to grow because um, you're creating value and that um, you know you can create more, more revenue and, and money for you to grow your business further. Mm -hmm. And just the last thing I would say, and, and like DJ said on COVID having to pivot, you have to watch your cash burn like a hawk. Um, if we've learned anything over the last few months, unfortunately, that we just have to be prepared to, to handle those unexpected bumps in the road and, and do that and be able to um, live to fight another day. Thanks, Christina. Thank you very much for those comments. And you talked about being able to serve um, and see key metrics in your business, but also you need to be able to know when it's time to bring on folks as well to be able to grow. So Terry, um, the last panel question that I'll ask is to you. Um, in order to manifest greater business growth and success, it's critical for business owners to build solid teams. In your role leading HR at Coke Engineer Solutions, please share your advice for finding key talent and managing business teams for success. Uh, thanks, Christina, and, and um, uh, to everyone, just uh, humbled for the opportunity to, to speak. And, and before I start, I'd be remiss if I, I am just... Uh, inspired by DJ and Miranda and their stories. Um, as uh, DJ said, it's just really good seeing um, our people. And I, I think the takeaway for me is a quote I'd heard uh, years ago that ultimately you won't be defined by what knocks you down, but how you get up. And uh, they're very inspiring. And uh, DJ, hopefully I can get down there and, uh, and hopefully one of those 16 flavors is Cavassier, but that's another story. So uh, uh, I would, uh, the first thing I would say, Christine, is I, I think if you listen to DJ and Miranda's story, before you start talking about talent, you start the conversation about the best way to get work done. If you look at their stories uh, years and years ago, uh, Miranda would have tried to figure out how to manufacture those things herself versus getting them from China. And you, in, in the world that we live in, uh, and everything from crowdsourcing to gig workers, all of that, you don't always have to start with bringing that talent on your team. It may be much more economical for you to outsource that or think about renting that talent and those types of things. So start with how do I get work done? And then if ultimately you decide to bring talent on, uh, uh, here, here are my thoughts there. Uh, first of all, think about the combination of talent, but also culture. Uh, 
sports provides uh, kind of an excellent analysis. You know, my my beloved Pittsburgh Steelers, and and uh, for those of you know who know uh, Antonio Brown, uh, clearly one of the most talented uh, football players probably in the history of the game, but has been on. Uh, three different teams and, and, and some may view him almost as a, as a cancer on the team. So think about the type of culture that you want to build in your organization and irrespective of someone's skills, make sure that those individuals uh, fit your culture. Um, the other thing just real quickly from an HR standpoint is uh, one, obviously you wanna make sure you have a, a, a strategy around how you pay and how you want to compensate people, how you're going to use compensation to drive the performance and the results that you need. Uh, you you wanna talk about um, you know, uh, making sure you have a feedback system to allow your employees to continue to, to grow. And then the final thing I would say high level is make sure you're getting good legal advice. As you grow, there are various thresholds based on the number of employees that you have that could kick you into a uh, additional threshold, additional requirements um, and everything from uh, how uh, you know, DJ mentioned uh, family medical leave, all those things. A lot of those things are driven by the number of employees that you have. And you want to make sure you're conscious of once you pass that number, what are the additional things you need to do? Thank you very much for that, Terry. So build a manifest, a key, um, you know, a key area on our agenda to be able to have dedicated some time to getting some best practices from our panel. And you know, sometimes in a virtual environment, you don't wanna keep people on, on a calls for like four hours or whatever, but I tell you, I could spend another two hours listening to them. And I will say that we are very fortunate that Miranda has agreed to be a mentor with us. Steve is already a mentor with us. Terry is a mentor with us. And DJ, I'm just gonna ask you on the spot, <laughs> will you consider just come on, join in the Create Campaign family and, no, no and pressure. With your, your expertise as well, too. We're just going to put that out there for you. But I will say, um, today has been really great. We are pushing towards our end. Um, there's a survey that we will be giving to everyone to be able to just kind of talk about what went well, what we could work on in this virtual environment. But you know, the programming continues. We have free business consulting. We will be kicking off our mentoring cohort. Uh, we have connections to Martin Pringle that does free uh, legal clinics for business owners. If you have entrepreneurial questions around legal clinics, we have so many entrepreneurs who give time and space for their expertise. So I want to thank you all for that. I'm going to ask our panelists, if you can, hang out with me for just a little bit longer. Uh, we have three prize giveaways that we want to get because we want to honor everybody's time. Shaquille, you have one. Uh, one of our prize packages and we'll connect and let you know exactly what you won. Actually, no, I'll go ahead and share it. You've won a food packet. And so your food bundle includes all of the flavors of Soul Pop Gourmet Popcorn, Joe's Gourmet as well. We've got some Wichita Cheesecake Company uh, food in there for you. We've got taste uh, traces of flavor seasoning and Willie's Wings. We've got Sunflower Nutrition and a whole lot of others. So thank you. Lee Hurst, you have also won are another food bundle. And last but not least, we have Josh Patterson. You have won as well. So if you are a prize winner, we'll connect after this session to be able to um, get your prizes awarded. So I just wanna say thank you all for that. A few quick announcements. I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. Current slide. Okay. On behalf of the Board of Directors from Create Campaign, we want to thank you guys for pivoting with us. Uh, that time that you gave us is quite valued, and we do not take that for granted. So thank you for joining us. Uh, coming soon, we have a number of workshops and trainings as well. The Let's Create Workshop Series will kick off. It's um, pretty much a monthly series. It's an eight-week session where we'll cover various entrepreneurship topics in depth. We won't have to rush through, um, but that is coming up. You can find that information on Create Campaign's website. Our partners over at the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce and Kansas Business Services are having By Design. It's a vendor education series. The first one is coming up. 
um, and it's featured several, hold on, got a minute, okay. It's featuring several speakers from Martin Pringle and Price Bank and also Clean Levin. Thank you very much, Chamber, for reaching out to our demographic as well. Next up, we have, there's people trying to get in the waiting room, so it's, uh, there we go. Messing up my little clicks. Okay, as you heard before, the Wichita Entrepreneurship and Innovation Series is coming up. Uh, you can find out more information on how to schedule at wichitasupplierdiversity.com. And again, if you need a business mentor, DJ, 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 <laughs> we have the opportunity to connect you uh, with some great talents, um, not only in Wichita, but elsewhere. I want to thank each and every one of our speakers today. Again, this is the first time that we have done uh, virtual, and I was, in terms of having this big forum with multiple people, we had upwards to 70-something people on the call. We have 55 still on today. You guys were very gracious with me. I'm a perfectionist. So I'm going to go and beat myself up over some of the flaws, but I hope that you gained some value um, in this today. Uh, lastly, to our sponsors, thank you, Fidelity, Coke, Bank of the West, Network Kansas, Martin Pringle, each and every one of you, Aisha Henderson and Jonathan Long for helping make sure my flubs weren't as big as they could have been. This officially concludes our virtual forum, but I'm a hangout in case you all just want to talk. I'm done with the program. Y'all have a good rest of your day if you have to go on, but bless you and thank you.